the reason people like me and others are criticizing Asbury, if they haven't said it, I'm going to say it now. It's because we want you to have what you're looking for. And we love you enough to tell you you're looking for it in all of the wrong places. What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I am always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today, it's been a minute, but there's a piece of this Asbury revival thing that is not being talked about. So stick around. <laughs> I'm glad I waited. I'm glad I held off on this because time gave me the ability to look at everything that's being said and realize that the piece that's missing is why it's being said. So that's what we're going to address. So I look, I'm just going to be upfront and honest with you about it. Um, it was not revival not according to the Bible's definition of revival. Now, I know the criticism has been, who are you to say what is or isn't revival or what God can or cannot do? The answer, no one. I'm no one. I have no right to say what God can or cannot do. I do not put God in a box, but he does. So, as Christians who may disagree on this topic, where we have to unanimously agree is that we have opinions, but the only authoritative source and norm for all that can rightly be called Christian doctrine is the prophetic and apostolic books of the Old and the New Testament. And the only standard by which scripture can be rightly interpreted is by scripture. There's the baseline. That's where I'm starting. We can disagree on things and have different opinions, but scripture alone is the only source, authoritative source and norm for Christian doctrine. And scripture alone interprets scripture. And if you want a further exposition of why I agree that the Asbury doesn't fit the biblical definition of revival, check out the link below to an hour-long episode of Fighting for the Faith where the scriptures are exegeted exhaustively and brilliantly as to what constitutes revival in the Bible. Now, I am going to bring up some of the criticisms that have been made about what happened at Asbury, but this is the piece that is missing. Why? Are people criticizing it because the worship style is different than what they believe in? Are people criticizing it because it's not what my church does, therefore it's not Christian? Uh, there's numbers of reasons why people are criticizing it. There's a number of criticisms that people are making about what happened. But the ultimate motive of why they're criticizing it, I think, has yet to be stated. So here it is. Before we get into what those criticisms are and why they're valid, here's why they're being made. Because this matters. Because Thousands of people, nation and worldwide, flocked to Asbury. Faithful Christians either physically went there or tuned in online or were figuring, trying to figure out what happened, what was going on there, wanted to be there and participate in whatever it was because they were seeking God. They were seeking this, the very real, miraculous presence of the Lord. And that's something that Christians ought always to be seeking. The problem and the reason for the criticism is that this real presence of the Lord already occurs inside the church, has for 2,000 years, and does every single day. The problem is, for the charismatic camp, it looks dull, boring, and like a spirit of religion. But that doesn't mean that these people aren't heartfeltly looking and seeking after God. For it to have been biblical revival, there needed to be a stern preaching of the law, which I'll be the first to admit there was. The, the law was rightly preached to kick this thing off. 
there needed to be repentance of sin. And there needed to be a bold, bold proclamation of the gospel, which actually forgives all of these sins and brings peace. Now, I know you're going to come at me and say, but there was gospel and there was confession and there was demons being cast out and there was uh, people turning to God. And there was... I think there's an eyewitness that says it better than even I could. So I'm going to let him. At Asbury yesterday, I'm going to tell you what I saw, what I heard, and what I did not hear. And before you call me a Pharisee or anything else in the comments, I would encourage you to show the fruits of the spirit that you say you soak in the presence of at Asbury. Let me say, I am glad that there are people that want to get together and worship God. I know there are very sincere people doing so at Asbury. This video isn't about the worship. I spent three hours on the lawn watching the service from two screens with hundreds of other people. There was a woman behind me having something cast out of her. I don't know what it was. The worship continued for about an hour and a half after I got there, and then we heard the student testimony. They spoke of how Jesus delivered them from drunkenness, depression, sexual immorality, jealousy, and narcissism and the majority of them called these things that I listed spirits. The only time I heard the word sin was in an old hymn that they sang. They prayed and asked that God would bring his love to the nation. But in the three hours that I was there, I was never presented with the gospel. The gospel that seems to be coming from there that everyone's talking about is God loves you. And that is not the gospel. I know of others who went there and were told to turn to their neighbor and tell them the gospel, but the gospel that they were told to give was Jesus loves you and has a plan for you. The reason I say anything about Asbury is not to discredit the worship or the sincerity of anyone. It's because a deluded gospel or a gospel that is not preached is going to lead to false conversions. People that think they're saved, but they're really headed for hell. And I wish people would listen long enough to these concerns before calling me a Pharisee. That's the summary of what I experienced at Asbury. I wish the gospel was being proclaimed. It sounded Christian, but it wasn't. People were confessing the spirit of things. No, 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 no. Allow me to borrow words that the church has spoken for millennia. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and have justly deserved your present and eternal punishment. Sin, I, by my very nature, have sinned against you my God, in thought, in word, in deed, by what I have done, by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Actual confession of sin. Sin. Not spirits of things. And actual absolution. The actual gospel. The gospel of Asbury was God loves you. Well, God does love you, but the scripture expands on this. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the gospel, open up. The gospel, if you've never heard it, is this. Jesus died and rose again for you. And what does that mean? That means that you are, by his work, by his worthiness, by his merit, you are absolutely, 100%, unequivocally forgiven. You are redeemed. You have been bought back. You were dead and you have been made alive again. There is no guilt, no condemnation for sin for you. Go and be at peace. If the gospel is not 100% what Jesus has done on your behalf, it's not the gospel at all. The gospel implied is the gospel denied. Why are these people seeking after it? It's because, by and large, speaking broadly, Protestantism has replaced the very real presence of Jesus with something else. They have gotten rid of the means by which he has promised to be with us always, and they feel that absence. And they're looking for this, this close, deep, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's an example of revival that happened recently in my life. This fits the biblical description, and it sounds nothing like Asbury. I've had surgery again recently. And I, the day of the surgery, I, since I've been mostly bedridden, I should, really shouldn't be out of bed now. The day of the surgery, my pastor came. It was just him and I, the two of us, sat in my room with me. 
He heard my confession. He spoke the Lord's absolution that what Jesus has done is sufficient and my sins are forgiven because I confessed, I repented, my sins were forgiven because of what Jesus did. He shared God's word with me. He prayed with me. We made public confession of our faith and then he fed me the very body and blood of Jesus Christ because it has been given and shed for me for the forgiveness of my sins and blessed me and told me to be at peace. That's revival. That is biblical revival. And it happened in my room with two of us because Jesus isn't at these big places where there's outbreak. He is where two or more are gathered in his name. He is in his word rightly discerned. He is in his sacraments rightly administered. If you are looking for something miraculous, then you don't need revivalism. You need divine service. You need the history, the heritage, and yes, the traditions of the church. These are where Jesus has always promised to be. This is where he always acts. This is where what you're looking for exists. And the reason people like me and others are criticizing Asbury, if they haven't said it, I'm going to say it now. It's because we want you to have what you're looking for. And we love you enough to tell you you're looking for it in all of the wrong places. It's in good, God-fearing, mom and pop churches around the world, little congregations with their little liturgies and their little traditions and their boring services and in the sacraments. It is in your baptism where you have been washed. It is in confession and absolution where God who is faithful and just will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It is in the Lord's Supper, which is his body and blood given and shed for you as a sign, a seal, and a pledge that you are forgiven so that at the end, at the end of the service, you can hear the phrase, depart in peace. Sorry about that. The computer glitched out. Let's close this out, though. Asbury Matters because as far as real revival goes, we need to use this as an example of the people calling this revival are the ones that are actually in need of it. The greatest example of, of revival in anyone's near memory is the Reformation, Luther's Reformation, where the word was brought back to the church, where Christians did repent of false doctrine and false practice, and where the gospel was restored and proclaimed again to the church. But you don't need to pay money or confess every minute detail. There's no purging away of your sins between eternity. It's a promise kept and delivered through word and sacrament. That's revival. It's the last great revival that the church has ever actually seen. If you're looking for this miraculous presence of Jesus, it exists where two or three are gathered in his name. It exists where the word is taught in spirit and in truth. And it exists where he has promised to be in the sacraments for you. And you might not like it. I didn't like hearing it when I was a charismatic seeking after these kinds of revivals. It exists in the confessional Lutheran church. It's not to say there's not faithful Christians in the Roman Catholic church or in the Eastern Orthodox church or any, any major modern, uh, Protestant denomination. There are. But if you want the faith once for all delivered to the saints, I'm sorry, that church exists in, in confessional Lutheranism, in historic liturgy and right teachings and right practice. Lutherans, we're by no means perfect. We screw up our, we're, we're a paper denomination. We screw up our practice of our own faith all the time because we too can get caught up in this charismaticism, in this enthusiasm, in this revivalism, and we constantly argue and bicker amongst ourselves. 
to, to fight for it and maintain it. But it's about what's good, right, and salutary. If you're seeking after this relationship with Jesus on a deeply intimate level, it's not in charismatic experiences that stir your emotions and make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's in the words given and shed for you. It's in the words, you are forgiven. It's in the words, go now and be at peace. That's where it is. God does miraculous things for his people. But our, our emotions don't acknowledge that that's what he's doing. We are a people that believe by faith, not by sight. And that should also mean not by what we feel. God has done very real things when I have not felt a thing because his word promises that that's what he's doing. Faith, true faith, clings to the promise. So I hope that added some clarity and hopefully my laptop doesn't shut the video off again before I'm done. So I'll close by saying, if you've been looking for it, it does exist and not where you've been looking for it. Come look at a Lutheran church, a confessional one not a, 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 a leftist one, a confessional Orthodox Lutheran church. That's where you're going to hear the gospel every day. Lutherans are spoiled by the gospel. We hear it every Sunday. That's why when we don't hear it, it stands out like a sore thumb and we have to say something about it. You want to hear that gospel every day. And let's face it, you sin every day. You need to hear it every day. You need to be Lutheran. That's just, I'm not ashamed to say that. And I've been that charismatic, and I'm saying it. It's a painful process to come, but it is so much better. The, the, the good shepherd who leads us to green pastures promises that the grass is actually greener on this side because he's the one leading us to it. You want that greener pasture if you want those calm waters. You want your soul restored. Then you need to look at confessional Lutheranism. That's why Asbury matters. And that's why I took the time to say something. Because I know what you're looking for. I was looking for it too. And who am I to say all of this? I am just a beggar who's looking at other beggars and telling them where the bread is. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and the mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.